facing anyone dealing with the public. How to distinguish valid arthropod induced problems from those conjured up by the individual's brain. So as a scientist, I'd like to believe that everyone is recounting actual objective experiences. But I've learned over the past 30 years or so that this is not necessarily so. We humans are prone to interpret dermal sensations in ways that make sense to us. And we thereby fail to comport, uh, to establish that they comport with what's biologically feel feasible. As Dr. Ridge said, we usually choose feelings over facts. Now, have you ever had anyone send you a box of Ziploc bags? If not, let me know and I can send you some. We regularly receive these with notes assuring me that the bags contain samples of what is attacking the sender's body. Now, more often than not, we fail to find any arthropods or if any arthropods are present, they're usually benign creatures that present no threat to humans. Historically, the entomological literature, in the entomological literature, this condition has been called delusory parasitosis. So you'll see me slipping back into that terminology. But as Dr. Ridge pointed out, there have been a number of names attached to this phenomenon through the decades, through the millennia. This is the delusion that one's body is infested with invisible bugs. And as she said, these people are not malingering. They are not pretending and they're not imagining it. It is a true reality for them. Uh, these, this of course is contrasted with entomophobia, which is a fear of insects, a, a very severe fear of insects in which contact with an insect produces anxiety and panic. And sometimes even thinking about an insect. And this is comparable of course, to arachnophobia, which is the fear of spiders. And interestingly, a lot of entomolo entomologists can handle things with six legs, but as soon as you add those extra two, they are paranoid about spiders. Interesting. And as Dr. Ridge mentioned, there's Morgellons. I don't deal with Morgellons. I'm an entomologist, so I only deal with things involving arthropods. So if someone claims they have fibers emerging from their skin, I say, well, you need a doctor. I, there's nothing I can do for you. And she alluded to this paper produced by Pearson et al. back in 2012, clinical epidemiologic, histopathologic, and molecular features of an unexplained dermopathy. There's the citation if you're interested in following up on that. You may also have heard delusory parasitosis or delusions of infestation called ECBOM syndrome. And that's the clinical term that's used that has less judgmental value to it. It doesn't accuse someone of being psychological or mental. <laughs> this is a condition in which the individual considers himself to be infested by invisible bugs. And let me hasten to say that this individual pictured here did not have bugs in his body. All of the injuries that you see there were caused by him taking a sharp implement, in his case of a pocket knife, and gouging out pieces of tissue that he then put into envelopes and sent to me for examination under the microscope. Through the months of uh, corresponding with him, we never found any insects or mites or anything else in the tissue other than typical gouged out skin tissue. But as you can imagine, he's going to have the signs of this damage for the rest of his life. Obviously, he was not pleased with the results that we presented to him month after month. And I want to echo what Gail said about the difference between an infestation and just having bugs around. Even if you have 100 mosquitoes sucking your blood, you don't consider yourself infested. So infested really means that there's a population of organisms that's living in or on the host. They feed on the host, they reproduce on the host, and they sustain the population over time on the host. So this is a true infestation. And of course, it can be distinguished from infection because infection involves microscopic creatures as opposed to these macroscopic ones like insects and mites. Delusory parasitosis, delusions of parasitosis, delusions of infestation, ECBOM syndrome is, as Gail said, an erroneous, unshakable belief that the skin is infested with a parasite. And to quote Koblenzer from a paper back in 1993, a delusion is a false belief that is not consistent with the patient's intelligence, 
educational level or cultural background and that cannot be corrected by reasoning. And believe me, after 30, 35 years of dealing with these cases, I still find myself thinking, if I just explain this one more time, if I'm clear enough, if I, this is an in, intelligent person, she can understand if I just put it in simple terms. No, there's not enough data. There's not enough argument. There's not enough scientific background to convince someone who is delusional. These people, have a reality that does not correspond with our reality. Now, as Rachel mentioned, I'm actually a veterinary entomologist, so I'm really more interested in what's happening with the animals. And unfortunately, a lot of people suffering from delusory parasitosis do have pets or other animals. And so these are the sorts of comments I get. My dog had another lime dip bath last week, and he seems to be much better. I think once the dog is free, my cure will come fast, implying there that the dog is the source of the infestation and until the infestation is cured in the dog, the human will continue to suffer. And then the next one, the dog sleeps in between the living and dining area and I think he is a reason we are still battling this. Again, attributing the infestation source or at least reinfestation to the dog. Next one, I do not believe my living areas are infected any longer, just me and dog, and I think we are almost free. So don't give up on the ozone treatment. And yes, here this is an individual who is treating the home with ozone, attempting to eradicate the parasites. The next one, there's a food grade DE, that's diatomaceous earth that you can put on your animals. And I wanted to, as an aside here, mention that diatomaceous earth should never be used on any living organism, especially dogs and humans. Diatomaceous earth is a very strong siccant. It's a desiccant that will absorb all the oils out of your skin, dry up your skin, cause skin cracking. You put it on your dog and the dog's skin dries out and the poor animal starts itching and feeling miserable and it scratches more and that reinforces the perception that the poor animal is infested when of course the sensation is being created by the supposed treatment. And then finally, I think the dog and I keep contaminating each other, trying to break this cycle, but <laughs> it makes me sad, but I may have to give up the dog in order to achieve this cure. He's great for about two days after the sulfur dip, then starts the itching and biting again. By the way, I contacted the vet and simply stated to me that dog mites will not infect humans. Not only is the human medical field ill-advised, so is the veterinary field. I don't understand how the medical professionals never contract this nightmare. And again, Dr. Ridge alluded to this, that people begin to assume that the medical professionals they're dealing with are ignorant, stupid, backwards, are just uh, trying to deceive them. So this is something we're up against as well. They don't necessarily trust the experts. And again, what Dr. Ridge mentioned about what bugs do sufferers blame, we do run into very frequently tales about springtails because people have come across these uh, illusions on the internet. Noceums, bed bugs, bird mites, and frankly, these are just primarily because these are bugs that people hear about. Uh, obscure insects never get into the popular press and nobody knows about them. Of course, as uh, we heard, these do not account for the actual conditions that we see. There was a study done several years back now by researchers at, the, at NC State, North Carolina State University. It was a sampling of creatures found in the average home. So they sampled 50 different homes around the Raleigh area. And when I say sampled, I mean very intensively sampled, as in getting down on your hands and knees using aspirators and attempting to determine what sorts of creatures are found in the average home. They found, as you can see here, that 100% of the homes had these creatures here. Every one of them had cobweb spiders. 
So don't be surprised when you find cobwebs around your home. You're just normal. Book lice. Uh, if you see in the hole there in between the two prongs, this is in a notebook and you can see how small a book louse is. Most of us have seen book lice. They're found in anything that's dusty and old newspapers, old magazines around our bookcases. Book lice are small and they have the unfortunate appellation louse because they do not infest bodies. They are strictly feeding on the fungal growth on the debris that we have around our homes uh, again especially with dusty books gall midges a hundred percent of the homes had gall midges i've been astounded by this because i consider gall midges kind of beneath the notice they're not important for anything really but they are very small insects they are attracted to lights at night and since they are so small and uh, weak flyers probably when we open the door the negative air pressure just blows them in and that's how they end up in everybody's home not something you would even notice they're very small insects completely inconspicuous ants i don't think any of us are surprised to find that 100 percent of our homes have ants in them and they were indeed found in every home sampled in the Raleigh area. Fungus gnats. This is something we get submitted an awful lot as putative causative agents of Deleuze reperistosis. And these are ubiquitous. Fungus gnats live in indoor plants. If you've got potted plants in your home, there's a very high probability you have fungus gnats living there. The larvae feed on the fungus found on the overwatered plants <laughs> around the soil surface. So the cure is to don't overwater plants. Let the surface of the soil get dry before rewatering. Fungus gnats are very common in indoor plantings in large areas, like in hotels where they have a large uh, opening, a large lobby with plantings in the lobby area, and they feel compelled to overwater the plants. So fungus gnats do really well there, and they fly up through the uh, elevator shaft and get into people's rooms and cause consternation, even though they're perfectly harmless. The adults cannot feed, don't bite or sting or anything, but they're annoying. And again, since they're so common, they are very commonly submitted as putative causative agents of Deleuze reperistosis. And then carpet beetles. Everybody has carpet beetles. This is an adult. The larvae are actually the ones that are out there eating up our hair and uh, they will eat just about any organic material. So those of us who are shedding hair or have pets that are shedding hair uh, probably have a good population of carpet beetles because there's always plenty for them to feed on. So the citation for this paper is at the bottom there. I recommend it because it's just fascinating. And again, these are the ones that were found in all of the homes. There were many other insects that were found in the vast majority of homes. And in fact, the average home in this study had 94 species of arthropods collected from the home. 94 different species were collected from the average home. That means some of these homes had a lot more than 94 species. So it's not at all unusual to find arthropods in the home. That said, to make the point that when these people provide you with samples that contain valid arthropods, these arthropods probably were collected from their home, but they're completely innocuous. They're not causing the dermal damage that these people are attributing to them. So as Dr. Ridge mentioned, if you want samples of what's affecting the individual, we need to acquire those samples from the individual's body, not from the general habitat. Now, this is a study that was done in Australia, and it's also intriguing. The uh, top six most commonly submitted arthropods included number one, their Australian paralysis tick, and you can understand why this would be. Everyone's concerned about ticks, especially if they cause medical problems like paralysis. So that was the most commonly submitted creature. Bird mites were number two. Not really sure why that was, but apparently they're very common uh, and commonly submitted. Bed bugs. Everyone's concerned about bed bugs, so they got a lot of submissions. And this was over a 30 year period, as you see there at the title at the very bottom 30 years of samples submitted to an Australian medical entomology department. Moth flies. Moth flies are very common. They develop primarily in uh, the junk, the gooey junk that collects in drains. So if you've got 
drains in your utility room or in the closet, in the bathroom, uh, any place where there are drains that don't get cleaned out frequently, and none of them do. That gelatinous material that collects around the drain is the perfect habitat for mothfly larvae. And then they emerge. Fortunately, the adults are completely harmless. They're tiny little moths. They're very attractive, actually. Tiny little flies, excuse me, that look like moths. And they're very attractive, but they're very small. You'll see them in public restrooms all over the country, all over the all of the time. Not at all uncommon. Again, perfectly harmless, can't bite or sting or anything. Head lice, yes, people are concerned about head lice, so you can imagine they're being submitted to the laboratory for confirmation, and same with pubic lice, although I must admit I was rather surprised to see that in the top 10. Uh, interestingly, they also mentioned that of 292 samples submitted for scabies testing, 80% were negative. So there's a high preponderance of putative cases of scabies that are actually not scabies at all. And as you see there, the of 5,655 submitted samples, 21.4% contained no evidence of any arthropod life stage. And yet the individual, whether it was a physician or a homeowner or whoever, thought it was a bug and submitted it for identification. So this shows that it's not just here in North America, but around the world in Australia as well. A lot of people are sending in putative insect specimens that contain no insects whatsoever. So as I said, springtails, uh, I think Dr. Ridge covered this very nicely, the Altshula paper and its impact on what we've had to deal with. Springtails cannot bite, they cannot sting, they're perfectly harmless and they don't infest humans. Biting midges. I mentioned this one because it has the nickname noceum. And when people are describing this pest that supposedly is infesting their body, since they cannot see it, it must be a noceum. So that's probably why we get this complaint uh, frequently that they are noceums. Noceums are, are outdoor living. They are like little mosquitoes. They come in, they take a blood meal, they fly away. They do not infest human bodies. Yes, they can make you itch when they suck your blood and inject their little salivary secretions, but they are not going to come indoors. They do not infest indoors. They do not infest human bodies. Bed bugs, of course, are not invisible. I think people attribute their condition to bed bugs because it's something they've heard about in the media. Uh, bed bugs don't live on bodies. They come in at night, they take a blood meal, then they crawl away and hide. Uh, they're very fragile, actually, and so they can't risk you rolling over on them and crushing them. So they have to be very careful and wait until you are in deep sleep so that they can safely approach your body and feed for a couple of minutes before they retire to a safe place. And thank goodness Dr. Ridge mentioned birdmites.org as their uh, statement of, of um, being is de dedicated to finding effective solutions for bird mite infestations of humans and their environment, encouraging those afflicted, facilitating research and a better understanding of human parasitosis. And she described very effectively that Bed bug, or excuse me, bird mites cannot infest human bodies. They cannot infest mammals, and we humans are mammals. Their little mouth parts will not penetrate our skin. Yes, they can attempt to feed on us, and for susceptible individuals, that can produce pretty severe pruritus, but they will die. They cannot live on human blood, which they cannot acquire, as she described, and they will therefore starve to death within a couple of weeks. You don't have to worry about bird mites. And if you're sampling for bird mites, this is for the pest control and vector control folks out there, putting out a glue board is a good way. No mites have wings, they cannot fly, so they're going to be on the edges of the glue. So you don't have to examine the entire glue board, all you have to do is look around the edge, and if you don't see mites around the periphery, that's pretty good evidence that you're not dealing with mites. Bird mites are not invisible. They can be seen with the naked eye. Here's a few of them scattered around on my hand so you can get a little impression of what they look like. And again, as Dr. Ridge said, they feed only on birds. 
Yes, we've all heard the term, the matchbook sign uh, used to, a uh, matchbox sign used to, people would wrap up their little samples in tissue, put them in a matchbox and bring them to us. Now, of course, we get samples more like this. This is uh, from one individual, one submission, Altoid boxes, prescription vials, water bottles. This individual was determined to prove to me that she had bugs infesting her. You can imagine how many hours it took me to look through all this material. And of course, nothing was found except a bunch of scabs and dried blood and pretty disgusting effluvia coming from the human body. But this is the sort of material we get. And I think this is one of the uh, uh, hints that we're dealing with someone who probably doesn't have real bugs. If they have a real bug problem, they can usually provide us with a some good sample with minimal effort in one container. If they feel compelled to send us this many samples, they probably are overcompensating for the fact that there are no bugs there. And as I said, when I looked through the microscope at these samples, we just found skin scales, pulled off dried skin, dried blood, scabs, etc. Nothing entomological at all. And I feel compelled to mention this situation. This is probably one that has disturbed me greatly because usually we don't let people come into our lab we don't want to see these people i am not a medical doctor i'm not qualified to examine human bodies i have no interest in examining human bodies if you have an arthropod send it to me i will attempt to identify it for you and then i can make recommendations about what to do about it but this individual unfortunately lives in georgia and we had been corresponding for a while she was not getting satisfaction from the information i was providing that she in none of the samples she submitted had demonstrated that she had any insects or arthropods involved. So she and her sister one afternoon decided to drive over to Athens and find me on campus. Uh, since she didn't have my address, she just started asking around campus and one helpful little freshman said, oh yes, I know where Dr. Hinkle's office is, I'll take you up there. So sure enough, they showed up on my doorstep. And uh, what did I do now? Well, I decided to take them down to the laboratory, set her down at a microscope and let her show me the bugs that she claimed were infesting her body. She reached into her purse, pulled out a Ziploc bag and extrude, uh, pulled out a pair of forceps, tweezers, and started pulling the scabs off the tops of these wounds. And I, in horrified consternation, said, what are you doing? Don't do that. And she said, well, I have to, I have to remove the lids so the bugs can get out. And her sister sitting over across the table said, yep, that's what she does every night after supper. She sits down in her lounge chair and she pulls off all the scabs. So as you can see, this has been going on for a while. She's created considerable damage to her skin. Now, why am I particularly concerned about this one? Well, this is a lady who was going through a lot of trauma in her life. She was married, her husband had just been involved in a major automobile accident and was in a rehab center in another state. Meanwhile, she was the sole breadwinner for the family. She had two teenagers and you can imagine the uh, drama going on in that household. To add to that, her daughter's best friend had just been kicked out of her house by her parents and so she had moved in with them. So she actually had three teenagers living in her household. And as I said, she was working full time and her profession was a registered nurse. So intellectually, this was a person who knew there were no creatures that could invade her skin and do what she was claiming. And yet, experientially, psychologically, she was absolutely convinced she had invisible bugs living in her skin, bugs that she, by the way, could see. She had been unable to convince anyone being in the medical profession, she had a lot of contacts. None of them had been able to confirm for her that she was infested with bugs. So this illustrates for me that, again, a delusion has nothing to do with educational level, with intelligence. It is a psychological condition and it has to be treated psychologically. You cannot argue someone out of this delusion. I wanted to mention that delusory parasitosis or delusions of infestation is the most commonly reported delusional disorder. We estimate that there's easily a quarter of a million cases in the United States. Uh, I'm currently receiving um, four or five a week, usually about one a day or maybe a little less, although that does change over time. 
And as Dr. Ridge mentioned, it's not uncommon for it to affect people in pairs or in groups in a shared delusion. There's even a medical term for it. I won't even try to pronounce it because I don't know French, but you, it means the delusion of many or the craziness of, of two, excuse me, the EUX2. And that means that entire families or entire offices of office workers can experience this phenomenon. Now that's intriguing, isn't it? That a psychological condition can be quote, contagious. We'll let Dr. Lepping address this when he comes up to the mic. Here's a typical email that I received from one of these sufferers. Dr. Engel, I've been suffering from what feels like insect bites at night, but can't ever see any insects where affected. So there we get the invisible bugs. Every so often, I think I see something flying past me, but have still never found one. I used a fogger for my apartment, and while it seemed to work for a few days, the culprit is back in full force. So nothing ever works. The problem is continuing. I also just recently returned from being out of town for four days, thinking the lack of a blood source would starve whatever it is, but it only seemed to make them hungrier. And notice here, as Dr. Ridge mentioned, they're called them and they. I feel like they're crawling on me, followed by an intense sting bite, then a little welt forms that when scratched turns into a scab that doesn't heal quickly, as in one to two weeks before they finally go away, the scabs. Nothing I've found on the web has been helpful in pinpointing what I'm dealing with, and I was hoping you might be able to steer me in the right direction for relief. And you see here several points that Dr. Ridge mentioned. Uh, the crawling sensation, in our experience, the first sensation they mention is crawling. Now, they may later mention itching or stinging or biting other sensations, but crawling seems to be the pervasive one, the most common symptom mentioned. And searching the web. Every one of these people has gone to Dr. Google and tried to find what they can. Usually Googling something like invisible bugs, invisible mites. Uh, if you run out of things to do someday, uh, go down that rabbit hole. Just Google invisible mites and you will spend hours looking at first person accounts of what people are going through. Now, I must mention this one as well. This one is one that gains my attention because Dr. Jay Traver, the author of this article, was a well-respected entomologist working on aquatic insects. And she served also as department head of the Department of Zoology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and was highly regarded. She had quite a reputation. She also thought that she was infested with mites. And she found a mite, which she named Dermatophagoides sheremtuskii, or called after what had already been described, and said this was what was infesting her. She was unable to find anything to control it. And she did try a variety of chemicals. Remember, this is back in the early part of the last century. There was no EPA. There was no requirement that you get compounds tested, tested for toxicity before they were used on human bodies. So she actually had a contact that worked on agricultural chemicals and that fellow would send her materials that she would then pour on her scalp and see if it killed the mite. She suffered from this condition for over 30 years and at the time of her death was still convinced that she was infested with mites. It was not until years later that an acarologist viewing this paper looked at the illustrations she provided of putative Dermatophagoides sheremtuskii and said, well, that's just the plain old common house dust mite that is a Dermatophagoides, but it does not infest human bodies. It feeds on the fungi that grow on human skin scales. So we've all got house dust mites in our homes. They're very common here in the Southeast because we have the wonderful combination of heat and high humidity that house dust mites thrive in. So this is a case, uh, as Dr. Ridge mentioned, of, of falseness, that the, this is just not true. This woman was convinced that as a scientist, she had discovered what was causing her own infestation, but it was not an infestation. It was just an incidental finding of a mite on her body. And this reminds me again that these people are highly educated, very intelligent, in fact, logical. She followed this through in a systematic, scientific way, but she was determined to confirm what she was convinced of in her heart of hearts. And sure enough, she 
got the results that she was looking for because that's what she was determined to do. So I keep that one into mind to remind us that none of us are invulnerable to delusions. As I said, we're getting a lot of these cases. We get a lot of people calling us, sending us samples and so on. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to do replicated uh, studies of delusory parasitosis or delusions of infestation. It's hard to find people who are willing to volunteer for such projects. So we've been using, trying to just get some baseline information, using the information that comes into us, looking at demographics, symptomatology, ba management behaviors, their medical histories. These people, as Dr. Ridge mentioned, are more than willing to share a lot of personal information and potential comorbidities. So what have we found so far? We've confirmed a lot of things that are already in the literature. It is most common in the elderly. Uh, Dr. Ekbaum, who was a neuroscientist, did show that it showed up most frequently in people over 60, 70 years of age. Uh, it certainly is more common. It's di di disproportionately affecting females. Uh, we get about two females complaining about it to every male who contacts us. And I hasten to add that this may be um, a result of females being more inclined to seek medical help, to be more inclined to complain. I don't know why we're getting more females than males, but that's what we have observed. They exhibit many self-destructive behaviors. If they're employed, they typically quit their jobs, probably for one of two reasons. Either they're spending so much time trying to eradicate the bugs that they don't have time to hold down a job, or Many of them are concerned about being out in public and potentially exposing other people to their infestations. So they quit their jobs so they don't have to be around people. They exhibit obsessive laundering and cleaning. They get up early in the morning, they start spraying Clorox on everything and they scrub and they launder and they wash and then they fall into bed exhausted. Uh, if I exhibited even a fraction of the effort that they put into it, uh, I would have a home that I could be proud of, but this is not what I spend my time doing. If they cannot get rid of the infestation that way, they burn or destroy the furniture because again, they assume the infestation is coming from outside their body and reinfesting the body. They exhibit repeated pesticide misuse and abuse. As you know, you can go online now and order any active ingredient. And these people are not restricted by how many times they can apply it or at what rates they apply it. <laughs> they do not pay attention to anything recommended by the EPA. They use all sorts of home remedies. I have heard the gamut, all sorts of botanicals and chemicals and whatever they can come across. If they cannot get rid of the environmental infestation, they will eventually abandon the home, just move out. They typically move in with friends or family. You can imagine what kind of house guests they make, spending the majority of their time awake talking about their invisible bugs. So eventually they lose the opportunity to live with other people and they find themselves moving to hotels. They run through their entire savings, life savings, and are homeless and penniless. We have been contacted by many people who are reduced to just living out of their vehicles. In fact, we have one fellow who is a truck driver. That's the only thing he owns in this world. And he interestingly has contacted us for seven years, once a year, every year, just to see if we've figured out what's infesting him. And they exhibit self-mutilation and excoriation, as I've shown you with the uh, registered nurse and the first fellow I showed you that been digging things out of his body with his pocket knife. They are more than willing to provide us with specimens, which, as I mentioned, typically consist of gobbets of tissue and other debris. And as I mentioned, they can go around the house and dust out the window sills, clean out the light fixtures, and get all sorts of arthropod specimens. But this, again, does not indicate that there's any connection between these specimens and what's causing the discomfort their body's experiencing. They usually are able to provide us with elaborate descriptions of the pest in its life cycle. They can even draw what the pest looks like. And they usually have some story like they lay their eggs on Tuesday morning and they hatch by Friday afternoon and they get in my bloodstream and they come out my lungs and they fly around the room and they mate and then they start laying eggs again. Just incredible life cycles. 
And again, because they assume that their environment's infested, it's not at all unusual for these people to rip out their carpet, and discard household belongings. So if you see something like this, you may be looking at a case of delusions of infestation or potentially um, bed bugs. Bed bugs, same phenomenon. People want to get rid of their belongings because they think that's how they'll get rid of the infestation. Most of these people experience social isolation. As I mentioned, they do feel a lot of um, moral responsibility for not allowing someone else to get infested. Some of the saddest cases we run across have been when elderly people have not allowed their family to come around for years. We've got some elderly folks who have not seen their grandchildren in over a decade. They just are so concerned that they might infest their, their family members. We have found that if we let these people talk, we find that very frequently the onset of their symptoms was preceded by some major life event. This can be a divorce, uh, death in the family, loss of a job, having to move, things like that. Something that was a major life event to them, something disturbing, alarming. And then immediately or soon thereafter, they started experiencing these symptoms of invisible bugs. Now, by the time they get to us, they have consulted several physicians and they have stories about these doctors and how unfeeling they are and how the doctors dismissed them or the doctor thought I was crazy. So they are not receiving from the medical profession the type of attention that they need or want. By the time they reach us, they've suffered with their delusion for about, a, about three years and um, they, as Dr. Ridge mentioned, are pretty well entrenched in their delusion. They are invested in it at this point. There's no talking them out of it. And this is not to say that they get better after they talk with us. Uh, there is nothing an entomologist can do for these individuals. They are going to continue to suffer from this horrible condition until they find a physician who is willing to treat them and treat their psychological condition. As I mentioned, they complain of this crawling sensation, then frequently some other concomitant situation like stinging, biting, or itching. And they are adamant that it's an infestation. And if I, there were a stronger word than adamant, I would use it. These people cannot be dissuaded from their delusion. Almost all of them express desperation. If you look back through my emails, you'll see the word desperate, desperation very, very frequently. In fact, when the phone rings, if I hear someone say, Dr. Hinkle, you have to help me, I'm desperate. I am pretty sure where that conversation is going to go. These are individuals who are convinced that they are infested, they have not received any help from anyone else, and they think that I'm their last hope, or I've been told that anyway. So they are desperate. And as I mentioned, this delusion is often shared by someone else. I still find this an interesting phenomenon and uh, it deserves research as well. As I mentioned, they treat their bodies with all sorts of chemicals. So if they didn't have dermatological damage to begin with, they certainly do after they've washed with gasoline, vinegar, peroxide, alcohol, kerosene, et cetera, things that are pretty harsh on the skin. And as I mentioned, they go through extreme efforts to try to eliminate the supposed infestation from their home, scrubbing, ripping out the carpet, taking the furniture out back and setting it ablaze, um, none of which obviously solves their problem. So think about the economic consequences here, uh, pretty much destroying their households, getting rid of belongings. As Dr. Ridge said, the cause of delusory parasitosis is not yet known. Why do people dig holes in their skin? We don't know. Might mention that prescription drugs may have something to, some role to play in this. If you look at the top 10 prescription products here in North America, you'll notice that the potential side effects, and this, these were gathered from reading the uh, package inserts, you know, that tiny little print that comes with every prescription drug. Notice the, that hallucinations apply to nine of them and paresthesia, that creepy crawly sensation, something crawling on your skin, uh, can be attributed to all of them. So potentially there are a lot of dermal hallucinations that could be accounting for some of the DP cases that we see. I'm proposing this as a theory 
remember you're hearing an entomologist. I should not even be addressing this topic, but I do find it intriguing that certainly in the elderly, the numbers of prescription medications used are very high. I think Dr. Ridge said something like a dozen, not unusual. I think the average person over 65 in the United States is taking, I believe half a dozen prescription medications at any given time. Certainly OxyContin and its relatives have been responsible for some horrible effects here in our country. If you look at the package inserts, again, paresthesia and hallucinations are potential side effects. So maybe the epidemic of addictions uh, can be blamed for some of the cases of DP that we've encountered as well. And recreational drugs, cocaine and methamphetamines, both can be accused of having symptoms and side effects. Cocaine bugs, a term actually used in the medical literature. Meth mites used in the medical literature. The medical profession is aware of this. So there are bad consequences to using illegal drugs and certainly having bugs coming out of your skin would be dissuading to some of us, if not to others. Even the <laughs> advertisements. Picking for bugs under your skin isn't normal, but on meth it is. Fortunately, I haven't gotten into this part of society, so I was unfamiliar with this, but uh, apparently it's quite real. But it's been known for years. This was from an article several years ago. The patient complained of a worm infestation in his neck. He used a pair of scissors to excise the imagined worms. Don't think you'll be surprised to hear that the toxicology screening of this patient was positive for cocaine, opiates, and tranquilizers. So these people have severe problems. And again, looking at the elderly, why might psychological causes be real explanations for why people in their latter years suffer from invisible bugs? Well, we know that certainly they're susceptible to stress. They're being faced with uh, loss of autonomy, uh, facing death. They don't see their friends or family. They're losing their friends and family. They're locked away, they're forgotten. So yes, there's a lot of stress in their lives. You can imagine they're anxious and not surprisingly depressed. So these individuals certainly are susceptible for um, causes of delusory parasitosis. Um, you can imagine there would be dermatological manifestations of psychological conditions. And certainly this might be one explanation for invisible bugs. So what do we entomologists do? Well, with any integrated pest management program, the first imperative is to identify the pest. And when we look at all these samples and we cannot find a causative agent, we have to explain that we cannot make recommendations until we have identified a pest. At that point, I typically say it's a medical condition. You need to consult a physician. And they come back with, I've been to a dozen doctors. None of them take me seriously. They all tell me I'm crazy. Nobody will do anything for me. So as Dr. Ridge said, you have to be prepared for belligerence, for anger, for resentment, because these people have been through a lot. I do want to see what they think is affecting them. So this is my standard, again, echoing what Dr. Ridge said. When they feel a sensation on the skin, I want them to take a piece of clear tape. I want them to apply it to the area. Now, logically, anything that's on the skin there is going to be entrapped in the mucilage on the adhesive tape. And then want them to fold the tape over, box it up, and ship it to me. When I put it under the microscope, what will I find? Well, I typically find the sorts of material that you would find on anybody's skin. The one on the upper left-hand corner is actually a small piece of carpet fiber. And as you can see, it's been twisted and now it's unwinding. So you've got all those little filaments coming loose from the single strand of uh, carpet fiber. Upper right-hand corner is a scab with a bunch of hairs and other car, you know, clothing fibers extending from it. Lower left-hand corner, same thing, a scab with a bunch of fibers, hairs, et cetera, extending from it. And then in the lower right-hand corner, I know what that is because I actually extracted it from my own arm. And the, the object you see extending from the upper portion of the picture there is actually the point of my forceps. 
when you pull out a hair, have you ever noticed the kind of rubbery root of the hair? That's actually material that's been deposited in the hair follicle that adheres to the hair when it's pulled out. And it's kind of spongy, kind of uh, resilient. So when you stretch it, it then recoils on itself and kind of coils up like a snake or, or a bug or something. And so you look there at that picture and you with the triangular head, <laughs> it kind of looks like a worm or a snake or something like that. But it's actually just the material that accumulates in a hair follicle normal material that you would find on anybody's dermal surface, nothing unusual, but you'll never persuade someone suffering from delusions of infestation that this is normal. So people say, well, how about we just go ahead and treat and see if that takes care of the problem? You know, we can treat with water. We don't have to treat with these since it's a psychological condition. Well, the pest control companies that have tried this have found that, yes, the placebo, work, the placebo effect works you get temporary relief. However, as we noticed in some of the letters that I read to you, the problem always returns. This is temporary. The symptoms usually come back and they're usually more severe than before. And now the sufferer has someone else to blame. <laughs> so we don't recommend this. Of course, it's not ethical to treat uh, without uh, using the proper materials and again, IPM says that we don't treat until we find the pest, a target pest. If you go online, of course, you hear about a lot of creatures that don't exist. There is no such creature as a black pepper mite, even though you can find lots of websites discussing them. There's no such thing as a paper mite, even though you can find lots of allusions to them on the internet. No mites have wings, so there are no flying mites. And yet you hear people talking about, I saw them flying around the room. There was, you know, the light was on and they, then the light, shaft of light. Have these people never been to a movie theater and looked up at the stream of light above and seen all the debris bouncing around in that light? Uh, dust motes are everywhere. They are ubiquitous. They're part of our world and everybody knows about them, but somehow people suffering from delusions of infestation are able to interpret them as bugs. So the conclusion is there really are only two arthropods that infest human bodies, scabies mites and human lice. And Dr. Ridge alluded to both of these. Because they live exclusively on human bodies, there's no role for pest control in their treatment. They are strictly medical condition. Okay, yes, I'm cheating a little bit here because there are three species of human lice. There are head lice, body lice, and pubic lice, but I'm lumping them all together as lice. And really, these are the only creatures that live in or on the human body, feeding on the body, reproducing on the body, sustaining their populations over time on the body. Nothing else does this. You'll notice also that neither of them have wings. So if anyone complains about flying insects infesting their body, that's not true. So just a few summary statements. No insect or mite can live in the environment and switch to infesting the human body. Parasites are parasites. They're obligatory parasites. They cannot switch to living uh, uh, on the, in the environment. No insect or mite can feed on inorganic materials, so they cannot survive on furniture or carpeting. They cannot live on nylon or aluminum. And when you hear cases of, well, they're eating up my pots and pans and then they're infesting my body. Uh, can't happen. No winged insects infest human bodies, as I mentioned. No visible mites or insects infest human bodies. In fact, there are no invisible mites or insects. Yes, there are microscopic ones, but no invisible ones. No external animal parasites can infest humans. Now notice I said external animal parasites. Yes, you can get parasites from other animals, specifically in their feces, so never consume animal feces. I don't think I had to tell you that. Bird mites cannot infest humans. As Dr. Ridge emphatically said, they cannot do it. We are mammals. They can only live on avians. Human body infestation is a medical condition and must be treated by a physician. All I can do is tell you whether or not there are bugs there. So what is your role? Well, we have to determine if insects or mites are involved, and that should be reasonably straightforward. I say should be. Then we recommend that the sufferer consult a physician and 
trust me, through experience, I have learned that it is unproductive to tell the individual that they need mental health evaluation. This should come from their physician. This should not be told to them by an entomologist or vector control or pest management or any other groups. And as Dr. Ridge said, I would ask you, do not call the wounds bites. You are the authority. You are the expert. If you say bites, if you confirm that they are bites, then the individual will never forget that. We call them wounds. We call them lesions. We call them scars, scabs, damage to the skin, whatever. But they're not bites unless we know that mouth parts have penetrated the skin. And we don't know that. Remember, you're the expert. Don't believe everything your caller says. We can recommend pesticides only when a target pest has been identified. So no matter how sadly Ms. Smith is looking at you and wondering, why won't you help me? If they claim their body's infested, it constitutes a medical condition and should be referred to a physician. I look forward to hearing what Dr. Koo and Dr. Lepping have to say about this. And here's one situation. This woman was convinced that she had a worm in her cheek. And she could confirm this because when she put peroxide on her cheek, it drove out the eggs. So that white fluffy material you see there are the uh, eggs of this worm being extruded from her skin due to the application of peroxide. In fact, this lady was actually able to extract the worm and she gave, sent me pictures to prove to Dr. Hinkle that she had extracted the worm from her face. And as she had been complaining all along, she did have a worm in her cheek. And there it is. Of course, it's not a worm. It's subcutaneous tissue that she pulled from her cheek and she did a lot of damage in the extraction process. So here's the lesion that was left behind after she removed all of that subcutaneous fatty material. She's going to have a scar for the rest of her life. As you can see, she's been trying to apply very heavy makeup, trying to obscure the damage that she was doing. But uh, at this point, uh, not even sure plastic surgery could repair the damage she's done. And to think that someone would dig into their flesh like that, it had to be painful. I think this illustrates for me just how driven, how invested, how deluded these individuals are. It must be horrible. To conclude, uh, I would concur that delusions of infestation, delusions of parasitism is a medical condition. There's my contact address if you'd like to email me. Uh, I'm always interested in hearing other people's stories, but please do not refer your sufferers to me. I have enough to keep me busy. Really appreciate it, and I'll turn it back to Rachel.